Okay, well, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're short one moderator, um, you know, who I'm sure will be hustling up here shortly, uh, enjoying the caprese salad, I'm sure. Um, so why don't we just introduce ourselves? Alexis, you want to start first? Hi, I'm Alexis Rask. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Shopkick. Uh, just really quick on what we do at Shopkick, we are the largest mobile application that shoppers use in the physical world, meaning when they actually go out and shop in stores. So we provide something that's a companion tool that helps with product discovery, building intent for what you're going to shop for, and elevates the in-store experience, all while rewarding the shoppers for the time and money that they spend in the retail environment. And from the business side, uh, what we help large retailers and large manufacturers with is driving foot traffic, converting that foot traffic into sales, and helping with share of basket on the manufacturer side. All right, good afternoon. I'm Joel Hughes from Constant Contact. And uh, we're very focused on helping small businesses uh, market themselves. We've got a very large customer base of almost 600,000 um, paying customers, been around for more than a decade. And I think in the context of, of this panel in particular, um, focus on what we consider to be engagement marketing. Uh, our longtime CEO, Gail Goodman, in fact, wrote a book a year or two ago called Engagement Marketing, the idea here to be you know, reaching out to customers and prospects in an ongoing basis. And I think um, as we start to talk about loyalty and sort of the broader definition or definitions of what loyalty can be. Uh, we see it um, beyond the punch card and specific programs, but uh, we'll get to that as we move on. And uh, I'm Logan LaHive, I'm the founder and CEO of Belly. We're a two-year-old startup based in Chicago. Uh, we create uh, custom unique digital loyalty programs for retail businesses. So uh, at the business level, we put a tablet at point of sale, create a custom unique digital loyalty program for them, and we give customers the ability to have one card or app that they can use for their loyalty card at uh, all of their participating locations. So in the last two years, we were now the largest and the fastest growing in the digital loyalty space. Uh, we work with over 7,000 merchants uh, across 18 major markets in 49 states. Okay, and I'm Greg Sterling, allegedly the moderator of this session and uh, broke the chair, so I'm not gonna sit in this chair. All right, so um, how's everybody feeling? Alive, alert, vigorous, excited? Yes. All right, we will, we will accept nothing less than the highest level of energy from you guys. Um, so we had a prep call and we talked about a lot of things and it's, it's a, it's a, people think that they understand loyalty very well. It's seemingly a very straightforward topic, but in fact it's, it's actually not. And so one of the things that I'd like the panelists to, to do is just tell us what, what you feel is sort of the, the, the thing that's most misunderstood about this whole space of loyalty and customer engagement. What's the thing that people don't really get or understand? Um, what's most misunderstood about loyalty? I mean, for me, I, I think currently what's probably most misunderstood about loyalty is um, loyalty is not transactional. You know, I, I think um, almost everyone that's in this panel, kind of large technology companies that are working in a local space, talk about loyalty as some, you know, side feature or tangential, tang tangentially they're addressing loyalty in some way. But you know, I mean, loyalty is is really you know a, a one of the largest contributors to small business or retail businesses' success. I mean, at a, at a, you know, at a business's core, uh, you have like, three kind of key fundamental aspects of whether or not a business is successful. It's how many new customers do you acquire, average basket size, and then retention. Um, and you know, on the retention side, on loyalty, you know, most businesses are still, especially small ones, are operating with paper punch cards or fish bowls full of business cards. Um, and you know I, th that problem is not addressed at your local coffee shop, your cupcake, where you get your haircut by getting two dollars off on your bank statement. It's not about deals. The you know coupon behavior, discovery, uh, finding new places is not loyalty. And so it's a completely different customer behavior, uh, and one that is a very large segment that really isn't being addressed in tech today. So let me let me follow up real quickly on that because people often think that coupons are at the center of loyalty that you offer an incentive for somebody to come back a deal or a discount. Why are you so definitively uh, in opposition to that? Uh, coupons, deals are phenomenal tools. They absolutely are, and they can drive customer behavior. Uh, but driving customer behavior, driving a visit or discovery is not loyalty. Um, people are not loyal to you know, your local you know, dog boutique because you got 
a coupon in you know a local mailer. You're much more loyal to a, to a local business based on geography, product, service, experience. And so uh, you know being able to work with local businesses to help them create a more digital relationship with their customer, and it's almost entirely relationship based, opening communication tools and trying to create repetitive consumer behavior is not about you know just a discount and it's not about discovery. I mean, Norm didn't go to Cheers because of a coupon. <laughs> Yeah, I would say um, I, I agree with that 100%. I think the idea that uh, deals coupons that are very promotional and transactional um, can be used as tools, but fundamentally you're trying to build some ongoing customer relationship there. And certainly, you know, um, in our helping small businesses with email marketing for a long time, it's really you know getting an opt-in which starts to show an affinity and some level of loyalty, you know, to a local merchant, um, and then using that channel in an ongoing basis for announcements, information, certainly deals and offers in some cases, um, and encouraging people to share those things to get new customers, but fundamentally, it's, a, it's an opt-in communications channel that allows for an ongoing, growing relationship, and you know, loyalty becomes the result of that customer relationship management. Right? It's not necessarily, um, I'm trying to generate loyalty with this offer. It's absolutely, I'm trying to open a dialogue that's ongoing, it's in a trusted relationship. So I think that's um, how a, a much broader set of tools you could characterize as engagement um, sort of goes beyond loyalty. What's least understood in your mind about loyalty? Uh, that it's easy to pull off and that it's something that every consumer is willing to participate in with your business. Uh, meaning at Shopkick, we work uh, probably sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum with a lot of the nation's largest retailers and largest manufacturers and biggest businesses, everyone from Target to Macy's and Best Buy. And all of our retail partners have great loyalty programs. Um, and they had loyalty programs before there were mobile phones. And now with mobile phones, there are extensions that come into the store with consumers. But I think the misconception is that that is your only base of shoppers or that it's easy to get everyone to participate in that. If you ask most US households, they're enrolled in about 18 loyalty programs. They actively engage with very few of them, usually five or less. And if you see it play out on the mobile phone, everyone here thinking about themselves as a shopper probably does not want 40 different apps on their phone for each of the stores they shop at, big and small, on a regular basis. So the idea that loyalty can be put into a system or put into a program and self-contained and actually reach and address your whole audience base is a big myth. There's usually a whole pool of people outside of that who are not yet so crazy about your brand or so crazy about your business, and you should actually really be focused on building relationships and building rapport with those consumers as much as the ones that have already expressed that they love you, because that's how you fill sort of the sweet spot where the 80% of your revenue is coming from. So if the loyalists are the primary driver of your business, Focusing on them is great. Doing wonderful things to create value for them will continue to keep them there. The question is, what about the rest who haven't reached it yet, and how do you move more and more and more of them into that direct relationship with you? OK, so that's a, that's a phenomenal setup. But I want to go back to something uh, which we talked about before, which is the, the, the giving, giving the audience a sense of what percentage of the population of shoppers out there is really loyal and really driving that loyal business. And if you, if you could also sort of throw in your sense of what defines loyalty, what is it, you know, how do you even characterize a loyal customer in, in some of these situations? And I know it's going to vary by, you know, but who is a loyal customer? And, and what is the size of that audience as a general matter? It's, I mean, it's very difficult to speak generally about loyalty because well, loyalty, give, us, give us a specific but, example. But loyalty then. also to big box retailers, to grocery, to you know airlines versus a small business, completely different categories. It's dependent upon ticket size. It's dependent so, on frequency. So give us so a very specific things. But I mean, example. generally, you know, uh, you, you focus on at a high level, a standard 80-20 rule. I mean, most businesses, 80% of revenue comes from 20% of customers. Um, and even with knowing those statistics, you know, most businesses spend more uh, in terms of marketing and mind share on customer acquisition than they do on loyalty. You know, again, standard kind of you know, well-known statistics cost six to eight times more to acquire a new customer than it does to retain one. 
um, but you know, most of the tech out there today, or most of the things that even we talk about at these conferences, is how to fill the top of a completely leaky bucket. You know, we're driving new customer, new customer, new customer in discovery, but those customers are just not returning. And so, you know, a, a big part of how we can focus on trying to reduce that funnel or, you know, plug that gap, that hole, is, like we said, is setting up direct personal relationships and data on an individual level. Because loyalty is, is very personal. Um, and it's different for each person. So one of the things we do at Belly is try and work with each individual merchant to create a completely custom loyalty program. Understanding who your customers are, what your product is, what the owners are like, the culture of the individual business, the business objectives. And we try and create a loyalty program with an average of eight to 10 rewards that address different customer segments. Understand then who your customers are, that customer data, and then try to utilize that data in order to provide valid or relevant messages, offers, and opportunities to speak to an individual rather than to just your list. So, so Joel, you guys obviously both work with small businesses, Alexis works with national retailers. What's your sense of how well understood this 80-20 relationship is? Let's just take that as a, as a, as a truism for a, mo for a moment. Uh, do, do these small businesses understand most of their revenue is coming from repeat customers? Lots and lots of small business surveys reflect that they're most interested in new customers, that that's where the bulk of their focus is. They want new customers, new customers, new leads, and they don't really place a premium on these, these uh, established customers. Do they understand this formulation that uh, Logan has just I, I think they do, but the, the priority is absolutely on new customers. So we do a, you know, a customer prospect survey every year. And again, this year, I think we were at 58% on you know, the top concern of small business was attracting new customers, right? So, and, and I think in this whole discussion around in loyalty and engagement marketing, you're looking for that now online version of word of mouth referral, right? Which is still a very powerful thing for, for businesses. They understand their best customers also refer new customers, and that's a terrific low cost um, source of new customers, but they're still very willing to spend on new customer acquisition. So I think there's sort of this, um, between acquisition marketing, sort of this engagement marketing piece, there's a common tension, right? So how can we you know, drive new through loyalty of current? Um, and I think the 80-20 rule is generally recognized. They do know, especially small businesses, they see the same customers coming through um, and spending money. And undoubtedly, most of them, or many of them, are not in a loyalty program. I think your point of like who's literally enrolled in the loyalty program is still going to be a you know minority of your actually loyal customers. So so to now to go to Alexis's point about moving people in this middle ground into a loyalty scenario, um, you know it, it sounds like a customer acquisition really should be focused on people who may have been in your business once and then you know sort of migrating them into a more loyal position. Maybe that's a sort of a hybrid approach to acquisition. But, but tell us, tell us, Alexis, if, there, if there's a strategy that you think exists, if there is one, about how to do this, how to sort of migrate this vast audience of one-timers or one-offers or casual customers. I, I think you just, as a, as a marketer, especially as a steward of a larger organization, um, who, which is where the loyalty usually sits, either with merchandising or with marketing, you have to be open to a distributed approach. So everyone in the marketing space talks about paid, owned, and earned when they talk about media. But when you think about loyalty, there are the relationships that you own because the customer has chosen to participate in your loyalty program, and they've chosen to give you their personal data, and they've chosen to facilitate some sort of dialogue and relationship with you that way. However, there's probably a distributed approach as well that complements that, where you look for other indicators of behavior and you look for other metrics and other data points and other moments to talk to them, and you're willing to look at third parties to help you do that and just other forms of communication so that hopefully that customer ends up being known to you. We talk a lot in our, in our business with our partners about known and unknown customers of stores and customers of brands. And most of our partners do a very, very good job marketing to their known base. And they also do a very good job starting at the top of the funnel trying to bring more people in. And it can be challenging to figure out what to do with them once they get them in to keep them coming back and to keep them spending more time and mind share. So I think that being open to a distributed approach is not always easy for a marketer to think about. 
So, so let's, if we can, I'm going to put you all on the spot and get into some, some examples if you, can, if you can deliver this. I mean, you, Logan, were objecting to my general question about, the, about what is, defines a loyal customer. But do you have any, any examples or case studies that you can speak to really concretely about somebody who's done this, who's done a good job, uh, and how maybe they've done it, of pulling somebody from that sort of uh, outer circle into that inner, inner realm of a loyal customer? Think of any anybody? Can you think of any examples? Well, I, I would just say that um, you know we found again working with very small businesses in general is that uh, certain people would prefer to interact with a business, whether it's the opt-in or the ongoing communications, on different channels. So when we think about what's happening with mobile, what's happening with social, in particular, the last uh, couple or few years. Obviously, we started as primarily an email marketing company. Um, but we're seeing that you know, different individuals would like to be contacted and get information about your business and, and have that ongoing relationship on different channels. So it's not so much that I'm going to try to find Greg and send him emails and then also capture him on Facebook and also um, have him you know, uh, uh, follow me on Twitter. It's, they're often sort of these different audiences. So I do think it's sort of a multi-channel approach. But I think that we're seeing people willing to have different levels of opt-in and interaction as it relates to being a loyal and, and sort of communications channel um, driven relationship. Um, so that as we look at how small businesses can grow their more loyal audience, it's partly adding new tools and new channels that they can potentially communicate to them over. Jump in, anybody. Uh, so to give an example, um, one of the main sort of data points that we talk about day in, day out with all of our prospective partners, current partners, longstanding partners, is driving revenue and driving incremental revenue, right? Because whether you're a small business or a big business, you're trying to increase your cash flow and you're trying to sell more and it's a commonly shared objective. And once you find a way to drive revenue, if you're investing any sort of budget or cost in driving that revenue, your question is, is it incremental? Meaning, did I need to invest money to drive these sales or would it have happened organically? So we are always talking to our 15 retail partners and our 150 brand partners about incrementality. And I won't share anyone's individual data because that's theirs. Well, but a, I can share a, it at a major an aggregate. retailer in such and such a category. At an aggregate level, we see a 51% lift in spend per consumer. So 51% incrementality lift, and you see it over a sustained period of time. So most- For the loyal consumer. For, for the consumers, whether they are known or unknown as loyals. For the Shopkick consumer, you oh, see I the see. spend behavior move. Whether or not that person has enrolled in each loyalty program of our partners isn't what we ask them to do. We ask them to visit stores more often. We ask them to water, walk a broader footpath in the aisles of stores. We ask them to check out certain products that might be relevant to their household. And so you facilitate similar behaviors to what a loyalty program facilitates, even for people who aren't enrolled in yours. And it's having the same impact on spend behavior. And to sort of build off of Logan's point on the coupon side, usually a coupon or a deal or a discount drives a spike, but then it drops back off because that person was inherently incentivized by something deal-based. If you can find a way to incentivize them some other way by creating some other strategic value, you can actually sustain that incrementality, which is why we are also fiercely sort of against the idea of just using discounts as the only way to drive loyalty, but that rewarding people or improving services for people, there are other things you can do. So what I heard from Joel was um, multi-channel approach, contact customers in the way that they want to be contacted. And what I heard from you is that the, the most effective way to drive, to move these people from a kind of an, an unknown to a known to a loyal customer status is to, in fact, use Shopkick. No. Or, or to do something that creates value. Right. right. To, so, okay. To incentivize them. I'm sort of joking with you. To, to incentivize or them to, to, Shopkick. to behave in ways that are consistent with what, what loyalty programs do. So Logan, can you be as concrete as possible about the how piece of this? How do you create a loyal customer out of a casual customer? 
How do you create, well, I mean, so to addressing like incrementality, like how do you actually get incrementality? I mean, one, I think one of the first challenges that you have in being able to create these loyal customers is just is understanding who these customers are. You know, and a lot of times we're talking about loyalty or incrementality being like top line sales, uh, you know, driving more sales. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's critically important to understand how you're doing in your funnel, understanding who those customers are and how you're changing individual you know, customer behavior, segments of customers and that customer behavior. So, you know, I mean, we primarily started out working with small businesses and in measuring the actual impact of the loyalty program um, is a challenge in small businesses primarily because when we put Belly into a new coffee shop or into a, a cupcake shop that's been open for seven years, I mean, you're literally creating the data set. Um, we're going into these businesses and it's the first time that this business has actually been able to associate like these are who my customers are, these are the contact, you know, contact information, this is demographic information, this is purchase intent, rewards that they want. So, you know, really creating that data set in small businesses. So one of the things that we try to do in small businesses is measure the incrementality of the loyalty program or how we drive incremental value from the loyalty program kind of post when we install. We don't have the luxury of doing a you know pre-post kind of analysis. We almost we look at the first 90 days of what you know customer behavior is like with Belly, and then measure the improvement after that. So we're really shooting ourselves in the fucking foot. But you know I mean that, that's yeah because we're creating that data set. In larger merchants that we've been able to start to work with, uh, we've been fortunate to work with recently. We have a lot more data on kind of pre. Now they don't know who their customers are, but they understand transaction, you know basket size, frequency. They understand you know average sales, ticket sales by you know different ver different cities, and so. You know, some of the things that we've seen, you know, we've been able to drive an increase in 25% you know, of average basket size. We've decreased time between visits by 37%. You know, and, you know, our program is shown to be truly universal loyalty. 25% you know, of our customers have visited four or more of our locations. Um, you know, but e examples of how you actually work customer through that funnel, it, there, there's no kind of one, two, three steps. I mean, we work with merchants on yield management campaigns, so driving customers during off-peak times through different incentives. Incentives, discounts, promotions work for certain customer groups. We try and create some rewards that are much more experiential than discount-based. So, you know, at, at some, at a comic book shop, we may have get a free comic book, or you can pick the movie on movie night, or you go in 50 times and you can punch the owner in the stomach. Now, that probably is not gonna work at Target, but that works at a small local comic book shop. And so understanding you know, who the customer is, what their behavior is like, and then targeting campaigns based on those segmentations is how you really effectively do funnel management. So essentially there is no formula. I mean, I was trying to get at some sort of best practices well, list or formula, and then you're saying there isn't one. That, I mean, there's not a formula, but there's key contributing factors in order to be able to help move a customer to, you know, through the funnel, which is, you know, first step is obviously knowing who the customer is. And this is one of the big gaps that I think retail locations and local have today is um, the traditional experience inside of a local business today is almost entirely offline. Uh, I mean, you, obviously mobile, but you walk into a small business today and, you know, you walk in and you have a, you know, micros or legacy point of sale system and there's almost nothing digital. I mean, you, you walk in, you open the door to a small business and you have 15 fucking window stickers. Like for it's the second time you've used that videos. word, I just want to point out. Fucking heck, you know. Uh, Third time that you point out. But, you know, so, so a big part of the loyalty program is helping the, you know, retailers transition the traditionally offline experience in store, bringing that online to establish communication channels, understanding who the customer is and being able to have a direct line of communication, you know, social CRM, understanding kind of their social behavior, all of those things. Having a direct line of communication enables you to test the, what works for your business in order to move customers. I was just going to say, I think that's, you know, that's sort of the about customization of a program, which obviously you're doing, but I think the idea that um, particularly, we, we do have a little bit of a bifurcation between sort of the big national stuff, which has generally been more, you know, you're spending more money, you're thinking more about savings, whether it's offers or points, and we've been sort of conditioned with airlines and a bunch of other programs there, um, relative to the small businesses who are thinking more about, to some extent, the experiential piece and really understanding, to Logan's point, understanding their customers for the first time you know, in the digital realm. And I think that's something where then the, you know, being able to greet people as they come through the door, if, you know, the person who's the owner is not working that day, there are a set of things that aren't just about discounts, it really are about, gee, just understanding the customer's who's coming into my store. The customer experience, I mean, wouldn't holistically you say the customer experience is really the ultimate, most, most important part of this whole equation on some level? Yeah? The customer experience? Yeah. 
I mean, customer service, the kind, you know, et cetera. It's going to drive long-term loyalty. Yeah, the customer experience, but I think, you know, this is, is again, where a lot of people in our space make a huge mistake. I mean, you, you know, even uh, Tim from Living Social was on stage yesterday, and he said, you know, we send customers in, and then it's, it's really up to the merchant. It's up to the store to create a good experience. You know, it's up to the store. And, you know, it, it, that's fine. That's, that's fine to any, but I mean, you, you could say that about it's up to uh, you to, you know, it's up to the customer to tell their friends about how this works. It's up to, you know, it's up to the, you know, to direct mail. And uh, I mean, we can inject technology into any aspect of, like, you know, the, of, of trying to change customer behavior. So as, as much as the experience, the food, the service, you know, the owner, like the design, the decor, location, as much as those are the largest contributing factors. Uh, being able to inject technology to understand what matters to that customer, being able to understand that actually have a data set of what actually matters is critically important. So the, to the two of you, Joel and Alexis, I want to ask, is there a particular channel? I mean, I know you guys come out of email marketing. Is there a particular, and you're a, a mobile app primarily, is there a particular channel that you feel is more effective than others in accomplishing these things, these objectives that have been laid out. And then I want uh, audience members to ask questions in our remaining time, if there are questions. Go ahead. Uh, so we are a mobile first company built all around smartphones and tablets. So obviously my belief is a little bit skewed. But the reason that Shopkick is a mobile application versus sort of something that you can, that started on the web or started as a point of sale system or some other touch point is there's the belief that we are sort of all addicted to these things and this is almost like this umbilical device, like you can't be disconnected from it for more than a second and if you see the light blinking, you check it and you watch this audience, everyone's looking through all the time. So this right now is the way that we sort of experience the physical world with an overlay of technology or with an overlay of interactiveness. So the reason that we feel that mobile is a great way to drive loyalty behavior and just good business value is because it's with the consumer at every step of their process, at every step of their life. We talk a lot about the arc from the couch to the store in our company, meaning the decision to stop to shop usually starts at home. The decision to go out to dinner usually starts at home. The decision to get a manicure usually starts at home. Whatever you're deciding there, if you're using this tool as part of the decision-making process, that can influence where you choose to get your manicure or shop or eat your meal. It can influence what you're expecting to order when you get there or buy when you're at the store or what service you want to get. And if it then follows you through into the store, it can continue to add value to that experience for you. So we believe mobile is not a channel, it's a medium. It's and a you lifestyle. can experience well, you can experience email through it, you can experience yep. coupons through it, you can experience social through it. So mobile is a medium, not a channel. So to, to quick, just quickly on that, because you know, I think um, mobile, obviously I'm not gonna be the panelist up here saying you know, mobile's not the future, but um, you know, I, I, I think you <laughs> mobile key, key consideration component for deciding, you're absolutely right, deciding where you're gonna go, what you're going to do, uh, in all aspects of discovery. But I think one of the things that you know, I, I encourage people to do is uh, you know, look at a small local business, not necessarily a target, but look at a small local business, go to their Yelp page, one of the things that you'll never see on their Yelp page is like a one-star review because the copy on their website sucks or you know, because they didn't like the cupcake shop's push notification. You know, what you'll see is, is all of the reviews, either positive or negative, are almost entirely based around the experience in store. The product, the service, you know, the staff, all of those things are an in-store experience. So you know, one of the things that we very much try and focus on while providing mobile on the consumer side is we try and help the merchant improve or create a digital interaction at point of sale, that moment when you're actually physically in store, engaging with the business, engaging with the customer, with the cashier, engaging with the product, and we try and help take that experience in store and make that a little bit, a little bit better. So Logan has a super hard stop right at uh, uh, 140 because he's got to get to the airport. Are there any questions in the audience? We've only got a few minutes. I mean, I have 10 more questions I could ask, but all you sleepy people out there, somebody ask a question. No, no, everybody's got this figured out. There are no questions at all. No, there we go. Yes, whoa, here, whoa, whoa, here. We People one. are afraid yeah, of questions. People are afraid to ask questions. Anyway, yes. 
It's just like a, a, a high school. We were just saying, it, it, if we could ask him over Twitter, you'd probably get a lot more. Yeah. Anonymity. <laughs> Go ahead. What's, um, what's Twitter? For uh, Joel, what is a good open rate um, these days for uh, deals and, and coupon type emails versus uh, your news content? And then what are some best practices to improve that? OK, so take the second part of the question offline. What's the, fir the, the first? It, it depends, but I'd say um, 20 to 40% certainly is, I'd say, the range. And 40 would be great, and 20 would be OK. And you can tackle him for the best practices after, after the fact. Because it's just too much to talk about best practices in the remaining two minutes or something. Another question, people who aren't afraid. Who is brave, bold? No? More testosterone for everyone? No, no one? Really? OK. All right, so um, there's a bunch of questions we didn't get to. We, we have about three minutes left. Um, just a lot of stuff about managing these programs, challenges. Uh, I'd like to give each of you a, an extended opportunity, since we have about three minutes, to make a couple of final comments. What are the one or two things that we didn't talk about that are important, or what are the one or two sentiments about engagement, loyalty, that you want these people to be thinking about when they go to sleep tonight, that they just can't get out of their brains, and that transform the rest of their lives? So. Start with you, Alexis. Or Logan, you can start if you want. More, and another expletive, if you would, please. <laughs> um, what do I want to leave people with? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, this is, a, this is a conference that's entirely based around, like, you know, local um, and working with local businesses. And, you know, I, I think we've heard loyalty come up as a topic quite a bit. And this is even a panel conversation about it. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very rarely like a core business practice and there's no real leader or winner in that space. I mean, we're the largest now, but you know, I think in, in local is very much a winner take most kind of space. I mean, you talk about online ordering, reviews, deals, clear winners um, in all of those spaces. And loyalty is still, uh, in a lot of places, punch cards and fish bowls. And so being 80% of small business revenue coming from 20% of customers, it's a massive, massive, massive opportunity and deserves our, undis our like, uh, you know, undecided focus. Okay, Joel, maybe not so expansive as, as I said you yeah, could I would, be. Yeah, I would just say, um, consider again, thinking particularly from the small business standpoint, but um, think a little bit about loyalty from the consumer side too, right? So it does, <coughs> I would just leave you a couple, um, maybe metrics from us. So we have, again, you know, more than half a million small business customers on average that got, you know, more than, um, uh, a couple thousand people on their sort of opted in email list. So I do think that, you know, email as the workhorse, mobile is so much more personalized and targetable and, and better for a lot of different, um, more personalized interactions. But fundamentally, the way to I think, get the largest, you know, swath of, of initially engaged and potentially loyal customers is still, you know, email is sort of the lowest bar there. Um, and we're seeing, we've got a, a, a company required called Cardstar, which is a, has a free consumer app for big box loyalty. And in that case, we see you know, each consumer with about 20 to 30 cards you know, of, of national um, retail. Um, and we see about 15, each individual person opted into 15 local businesses. So I think there's this mix from a consumer standpoint of about sort of half national, half local in terms okay. of their attention cycles for loyalty. OK, so we're sort of out of time, but make your no, no, well, so one, one, one or two quick things that you want to leave these people with. As a business owner, you just have to spend, if, if loyalty is important as we're all saying it is, which we agree, and it's the lifeblood of your business from the sustainability standpoint, you have to put yourself in the mindset of the end consumer. So you can think about the type of email you'd like to receive, the types of things that would make your in-store experience or your in-restaurant experience better, the types of things that would get you to engage through social channels. And if you can't answer those things for yourself, you probably cannot answer those and do those well for your customers or your consumers. So having a really distinct, really clear point of view and being able to imagine what motivates different segments of mindset and different segments of consumer behavior and then have ability to address each of those probably gives you a better fighting chance at building your loyal base. Okay, great. Great advice. Join me in thanking the panelists for their thoughtful remarks. Thank you.